Welcome to Series 4 of the Public Interest Technology PIT Colloquium. We're delighted to be hosting this series and have an engaging program lined up. My name is Roba Abbas and I'm a Senior Lecturer in the School of Business at the University of Wollongong, Australia and the Socio-Technical Systems Technical Committee Chair at the IEEE. I'm joined today by my co-host, Professor Katina Michael, who is the Director of the Society Policy Engineering Co Collective in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society at Arizona State University, and is also the Editor-in-Chief of the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society. As always, Katina and I would like to acknowledge Cindy Dick, Melissa Waite, and the events team at the College of Global Futures at ASU for their support of this series. Before we introduce our guests for today, I would like to take a moment to reflect on our colloquium to date. We journeyed from series one, which focused on values, responsible innovation, and COVID specific technological responses to series two, which centered on storytelling, imagination, and participatory design methodologies, and onto series three, which emphasized the global perspective with respect to the social, regulatory, and ethical considerations relevant to the design, development, and delivery of technology in the public interest. In this series, we illuminate a path toward transdisciplinarity, hosting international speakers who will share with us their perspectives on topics such as experts and expertise, innovation ecosystems, multi-stakeholder approaches, and the opportunities and challenges relating to addressing complex societal challenges. In this session, we're delighted to be hosting three wonderful speakers who will explore highly integrative basic and responsive research, transdisciplinarity and the link with public interest technology. We welcome Professor Lorne Whitehead, Dr. Ms. Michelle Mossman and Professor William DeBars to the PIT Colloquium. We also extend our welcome to our live attendees and thank you for your attendance. Please feel free as we hear from our speakers today to note any questions, comments or reflections in the chat window or indicate that you wish to speak during the Q&A session. We will now move on to our presentations. It gives me great pleasure to introduce each of our speakers. Our first speaker is Professor Lorne Whitehead, who currently serves as the director of the High Bar Research Alliance. He, he is the University of British Columbia Special Advisor on Entrepreneurship, Innovation and Research, and a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. He has held several administrative positions, including Associate Dean, VP Academic and Provost, and Leader of Education and Innovation. He holds 143 US patents and that find application in computer screens, televisions and lighting products and has launched several spin-off companies. He received a PhD in physics from UBC and has considerable experience in technological, business and administrative innovation and in industry. Our second speaker for today is Dr. Michelle Mossman, who is currently the manager the manager for the High Bar Research Alliance. She is a research associate in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of British Columbia. And since 2002, she has been the laboratory manager for the UBC Sustainable Solutions Applied Physics Laboratory. From 1998 to 2006, she was a primary researcher and a co-inventor of the CLE electronic paper technology, first as a PhD student and later as a postdoctoral fellow. Michelle was also a co-founder and consultant to a UBC spin-off company that was incorporated to develop further and commercialize the technology. She received a PhD in physics from UBC in 2002 and an MBA from UBC's um, School of Business in 2014. And our third and final speaker is Professor William DeBars, who is a research professor in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society at Arizona State University. He is also a Senior Global Futures Scholar in the Global Futures Laboratory and an Affiliate Scholar in the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes. Professor DeBars is also the Senior Director of Research for the New American University in the Office of the President. He is also the co-author of ex uh, several excellent books with Professor Michael Crow, um, one of which is The Fifth Wave, The Evolution of American Higher Education, and the second is Designing the New American University. Thank you for joining us, Professor Whitehead, Dr. Mossman, and Professor DeBars, and I'll now hand over to you. Well, thanks again. Um, the, the title shown here is the title for this entire talk, and um, I'm going to be just saying a few opening words, uh, introducing the ideas of, of high bar research and, uh, and uh, how, what high bar research is and, and what it means. So let me start with the word high bar. High bar is, uh, is an acronym. Uh, it's an adjective that describes research projects. Um, and, uh, and the acronym HIBAR stands for Highly Integrative, Basic, and Responsive. 
So a high bar research project is a project that has these characteristics, which I'm now about to describe. Uh, it's also a nice sounding word, and we found it useful to distinguish it uh, from other, other kinds of research projects, which are also wonderful, uh, but different in an important way that I'll be describing. So what is a high bar research project? Um, the, the key thing about high bar research projects is that they combine, each high bar research project combines two dualities. And what I mean by that, I'll just show you the dualities, it's the easiest thing. So one of those dualities is the combination of academic leadership and societal leadership. So two different uh, kinds of leaders, I suppose you could say, leaders from two different places. Uh, and the second is regarding purpose. Uh, high bar research projects have both an academic purpose and also a societal purpose. So that it's the, the presence of both of those dualities that makes a high bar project what it is. And to be a little bit more uh, graphic about that, I'll just take those four ideas listed above, academic, academic leadership, societal leadership, academic purpose, societal purpose, and show them graphically in these colored boxes below. And if you think of those as attributes, the thing about high bar research at the risk of being repetitious is that it's the, it's the intersection of those attributes. So if a project is a high bar research project, it's because it lies at the, at the intersection of those four characteristics. If not all four are present, it is not a high bar research project. It may still be an incredibly good research project, but it's just not within the definition that, that we're talking about. And we do so for, valid, we think very valid reasons that I'll be describing momentarily. But first, this would be a, a natural place uh, for a skeptic to say, this just sounds like a fancy definition for something that doesn't need to be defined. So what if we have four things simultaneously present? You could easily just say that about almost anything. Yeah. And so why do we focus on this? And there's a good reason, a historical reason. High bar research projects have in the past been very powerful, and I'll get back to that in a moment. But just to summarize this notion, the key idea here is that high bar research has these characteristics of being highly integrative, as I've just said, and also being basic and responsive. And what that leads to is the fact that it's very narrowly defined. So in fact, at universities today, although high bar research projects are well known and common and powerful, they're fairly rare. Uh, perhaps one project in 20 might be in that category. So it's a, a very narrow definition, um, but importantly, high bar research projects are, are very impactful. So that's the key thing. And what that gives us as a society is a very interesting opportunity. It's not like we're already doing mostly high bar research projects. We could increase the number of high bar research projects quite a bit without perturbing the academic system too much. So this represents a huge opportunity. There's an area, which we can identify and which we can build. And we believe the results will be huge benefits for universities, for society, and for the people involved. So that's why we're here talking about this today. So um, as I mentioned, there are broad purposes for high bar research projects, but let me expand this. The, the definition was narrow, but that doesn't mean that the impact or application is narrow. So in terms of the societal purpose, which must, must be present for a high bar research project, it can be in multiple different fields, some of which I have uh, listed here. Uh, and similarly, um, the academic purpose can be in, in multiple different aspects or portions of the academy. So there's nothing restrictive about the definition other than the presence of those two dualities simultaneously. So um, one of the important things that one of those dualities is this idea of co-leadership. And it's essential. And I think it's, it's important to talk a little bit about it. So cross-sectoral partnerships, that is the leaders that are in both the academic sector and outside, are absolutely key in distinguishing these projects. And so we mean partners, partnerships specifically between the university folks that are leaders and individuals in industry, government, nonprofits, civil society, and communities of practice. And here's you know, perhaps the most important concept there. All of those things are, are very likely places for high bar research to find leaders and they truly are co-leaders in the sense that I've just described. They're making decisions together. So um, carrying on with that idea, um, specifically, it's not just decisions in general, but importantly, goals and decisions. So the partners share an overarching goal to both discover new knowledge and address a specific uh, societal problem. And uh, 
I, I can't overemphasize the importance of that uh, shared um, belief uh, among the partners. Uh, they have to be on the same side. This can't be a competition. They have to be partners in doing something that they both deeply believe in. Uh, and they also have to be involved in all phases of the research. Uh, it's important that from the very beginning in the design of the research project, the people that will hopefully be beneficiaries over time are part in, are in the picture, sincerely part of the picture in the planning, and then that's subsequently true throughout the entire uh, duration of the project. Now, in terms of contributions, there are a couple of kinds that are, are very relevant to the success stories, the fact that major human successes have taken place in high bar research projects. So the first is that they're, the projects themselves are contributing to the knowledge base and the solutions that have an important impact on, on public in, in the relatively near future, not in the commercially near future, but in the relatively near future, we hope to see you know, significant breakthroughs that affect people. Um, and the integrative approach involved helps to accelerate the development and application of the new knowledge uh, in comparison to other research approaches. And I don't know that we always know why that's true, but it certainly is true that diverse groups in general are more creative uh, and, and more productive. Uh, and so there, it's not a surprise that this is true in the case of, of high bar research as well. So um, now in terms of the, the, those trusted relationships and the research partnership, um, it's just so important to have co-production and trust among those cross-sectoral partners because it does increase the likelihood that the proposed solutions are accepted and implemented. So it's not just that the solutions are good, but because they are good and were jointly created, the, there's a better receptor for them in the future. Uh, and those relationships that are built on that deep trust help to maintain, to maintain the long-term cross-sectoral partnership for the length of time necessary to actually see successful results implemented. So um, high bar uh, uh, research projects offer very meaningful experiences for the participants. And that means that engaging in a high bar research uh, project is one way by which people can have a meaningful connection, a meaningful societal connection through their research. It also means that high bar projects can draw people who are motivated to contribute to the public interest into research careers. So it's a very powerful um, idea from that perspective as well. Uh, well, it's a powerful idea, but it's important to emphasize it's by no means a new one. There is nothing new about this kind of research. The efforts that uh, Michelle Mossman will be describing shortly to accelerate and advance high bar research is somewhat new, but it's always been around. Uh, it's a time honored um, form of research. Um, and, and by the way, if we're talking about labels momentarily, it's a subset of use inspired basic research. So that use the term use inspired basic research is well known. And if you have the, the, the dual connection between society and academy, the subset that have that characteristic are high bar projects. So been around for a long time. Uh, and they have been impactful for a long time. So there are profound breakthroughs that have come from these. Uh, and, and while uh, the characteristics of high bar projects are specific, their range really is vast, including, as I mentioned earlier, to some extent, the range of research disciplines, the type of societal partners involved, and the areas of impact. So um, I'd like now to just talk about a few of examples of high bar research. And they're selected in part to demonstrate their breadth. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, the, the projects I'll mention are uh, highlighted on the website for the High Bar Research Alliance as well. So first of all, they, all of these projects can have global impact. And so the success of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines is a beautiful example. Most of us uh, received uh, the vaccine and they received it in the form of the lipid nanoparticles that were able to carry it uh, successfully through their bloodstream and into cells so that the cells themselves could produce the uh, uh, agents that actually uh, counteracted the disease. So this was a big um, a breakthrough. It, it came from work that initially occurred here at the University of British Columbia, and of course involved partners all over the place in both society and, uh, and in uh, various universities. Uh, and we are all much, much better off today because that research was done at a time when it wasn't clear what it would be used for, other than it had great potential. Um, maybe just a, a few other examples here. Um, uh, well, I'll mention the invention of the transistor um, because, and among other things, it is that invention is what essential feature in what made it possible for us to be speaking with one another right now. And of course, many other aspects of the modern world would have been impossible without the creation of the, the transistor 
which took big hot vacuum tubes and turned them into infinitesimal microscopic specks of coal dust that make everything work. So huge breakthrough, and it, and it absolutely was a perfect example of, uh, of high bar thinking and high bar work. Um, it took place in a corporate laboratory, but nevertheless, it had all the characteristics of high bar research. Uh, another example, and by the way, that one led to a Nobel Prize. Another example of high bar research more recently leading to a Nobel Prize is the case of the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, gene editing technology. Um, this is, I don't get into it in any detail here, um, but it's a very interesting area of the modern technology that's absolutely a high bar story. And it uh, did lead to the Nobel Prize for uh, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Carpenter. So it's a you know, one, wonderful example that's um, affecting us in many ways. I won't try to get into it at the moment, but hugely powerful. Um, also, uh, it's quite possible for high bar work to inform and drive policy. Uh, a beautiful example is a, a program uh, called Improving National Flood Insurance. Um, and this involved a new understanding of behavioral economics, um, uh, in, which informed and, and drives policies, including uh, those of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. So the project in question um, involved Howard, uh, Dr. Howard uh, Kunruther and colleagues at the Wharton Risk Center at UPenn, who deeply collaborated with policymakers, insurance providers, and disaster management experts to just lead to better ideas in this extremely important mathematically theoretical and humanly impactful uh, area of life. Very exciting work there. Um, high bar projects can also be super interdisciplinary. And the example I'll, I'll mention here is one that's not well known, although it is highlighted on, on the High Bar Research Alliance website. Uh, and that's uh, restoring historical audio recordings. So people have been recording human voice for quite a long time, since the very first attempts on, on discs were scratched in mechanically. Um, but many of those early uh, recordings are not playable today. Uh, the, it, and that's a tragedy because it means we've lost that actual voice experience. So um, a group of researchers centering uh, actually at Lawrence Berkeley uh, Laboratory, uh, National Laboratory, but also in collaboration with the Library of Congress that has many of these ancient recordings, developed a solution. They developed a way that light could interact with recordings and bring out the audio information so that we could actually hear the sound. If you'd like to hear um, uh, Thomas Edison, um, you can go to the uh, High Bar Research Alliance website and, and take a look at the uh, webinar on this and hear that recording. Um, very interesting example. And, and it's one that is having a huge impact on society in ways that I'm sure um, the, the, the technologists at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory would never have anticipated. It's a very nice story. Um, and it's uh, the case that high bar projects can be very large. They can be very large teams. Um, very nice example is the work uh, Educating for American Democracy. It's an initiative developed um, and uh, de developing a balanced national consensus framework for civic and history education. It's a large scale, really large scale high bar project involving hundreds of historians, political scientists, and educators all working together collaboratively across disciplines to help make a better world. A very exciting project. Uh, but the projects do not have to be big. So here's an example of a very small but beautiful project uh, involving identifying heart failure warning signs. This is a project uh, that took place at, at UC Davis um, involving new AI techniques as a tool to help identify early warning signs of heart failure. And I, I won't get into the details again, but the project involved as research partners, a very large team that included faculty, clinicians, and patients who were being treated, but also acting in, a, in an experimental way as part of the project itself. So again, very exciting. So um, all of this, I've mentioned these examples, but there are just countless examples and there have been for a very long time. They have the, um, the aspect of being very successful. Uh, and so it's interesting to kind of talk about success. And uh, we can discuss that in terms of both processes that can help lead to the success that we think is normal or appropriate in high bar projects, but also how to assess projects from the point of view of their likelihood of actually being successful. So um, let's start with um, uh, processes that can contribute. So fairly balanced interests and expectations in the decision-making is obviously going to be very helpful, but also very helpful in that uh, decision-making is this idea that results take time. So there's kind of a balancing act in high bar projects between taking the necessary time to actually get the 
um, the academic results that are necessary to underlie the success. And that requires, in some cases, patience on the part of the non-academic participants. So there's a balancing. Um, a sense of urgency must be maintained, but we must allow time to do the necessary work. And, and of course, the beauty there is that a diverse research team has the collective experience that can help with all aspects of those challenges. I think I've already mentioned that point, but it's worth repeating. So um, in terms of, as I mentioned, indicators of success, there are a number um, of factors that are really important things to look for if you're planning or carrying out a high bar research pro project. So a high level of integration of perspectives and expertise from start to finish, um, the establishment of common language, meaning that people are able to speak to one another from their different positions so that they can communicate and carry out integrated design um, activities and, and methods. So these are, these are good team activities in general, but they're absolutely key to high bar. Uh, it's very important that, that trusted relationships are built um, and experience within teams that are diverse is a wonderful way of helping to build those, those relationships. The net result is that basic knowledge is advanced and progress is made towards societal impact. And at the same time, it's been observed that work of that type leads to entirely uh, new and often unexpected synergies. And also the net result of, of all of that collaboration is that the research results themselves are more readily disseminated and adopted. So um, let's talk a little bit about high bar research at universities. Um, the universities have a very important role to play in enabling more, important, more impactful high bar research. High bar research projects have always existed at universities, as I mentioned, but they've been less common than the usual forms of basic or applied research. So we at the High Bar Research Alliance and many others believe that the time is right for a significant increase of university participation in high bar research projects. This will in, um, better align with the desire of many individuals and organizations, both within and outside of academia, that feel compelled to contribute to solving important societal problems. Well, it would be wonderful if we could just snap our fingers and do that, but the fact is uh, there's actually a need for certain changes of culture or shifts, I guess we should say, of culture to occur within the university. Uh, for example, as, as many of us are very familiar, uh, the practices of promotion, tenure, and peer review are very powerful. And I believe absolutely unintentionally they discourage high bar research. There's nobody that I'm aware of that's actually against high bar research. Uh, but in pursuing excellence, which is a wonderful and important thing, we can inadvertently uh, discourage high bar research. So we have to, without hurting the university system, we have to solve that problem. Uh, so it needs to adapt to better encourage high bar research. And the changes uh, must also strengthen the commitment to research excellence and academic freedom in general. And we believe they do. That's the great thing. We haven't actually found a problem in encouraging high bar research or a method for encouraging high bar research that can't also bolster excellence in general in universities. Uh, but this does require coordinated combinations of bottom up, top down, and cross sector action. Uh, and that brings up the topic of what might that action be, which is uh, the next uh, topic of conversation. Um, so I'm just going to, to give a, a brief overview of the High Bar Research Alliance. So the, the, the High Bar Research Alliance or the HRA is, um, so I'll talk first about who we are. Um, it's a, we're a distributed network of volunteers who are all uh, well organized and united in our support of um, High Bar Research. So this is an organization that was developed in order to um, um, uh, help to cause, catalyze the culture change, the culture shift that Lauren uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, the HRA, so our goal is for to increase the amount of high bar research in universities from the current level, which we estimate, as Lauren mentioned, to be about one project in 20, so about 5% of university projects today, um, to be more like one in five. So a fourfold improvement or a fourfold increase in the number of high bar projects at universities. But um, still um, a relatively small percent is still only 20% of university projects overall. So uh, not certainly by no means a majority of uh, projects, but a significant increase from where we are today. And the reason for this is that we think that this will help universities to 
um, respond more effectively to societal needs. So to, to use the strengths and the, and the potential of university uh, research in order to help address some key societal needs while also increasing the excellence of the basic research uh, results that they, that they contribute. Um, what we do, so how do we do this? Um, so we use collaborative action. So this is a, a, a people working together, people in different sectors and different fields, all of whom really deeply believe and are knowledgeable about high bar research um, to work with existing and emerging networks throughout the research and innovation community. So it's it's really important that this not just be a university exercise because the university or because the, the research um, ecosystem is so interconnected. And our goal, as, as we mentioned, is to help achieve those cultural and structural shifts within the university environment that will um, overcome those unintentional barriers that currently are preventing people who might want to do high bar research projects from being able to effectively do them. Um, everyone is welcome. So this is um, a very open uh, organization. Um, everybody is welcome to contribute to our activities, which I'll talk in a minute about what some of those activities are regardless of whether they're associated with an organization that happens to be an institutional member or participant in the High Bar Research Alliance. So I um, really encourage anyone who's interested in learning more about what we do and contributing um, to, to um, uh, contact us, and I'll include some contact information in a, in a minute. Our current members, we do have an organizational structure. So in terms of um, individuals and organizations can participate in HRA activities. We currently have 12 university um, members as institutional members and uh, seven and growing number of affiliates. So those are organizations who have individuals who are contributing to our activities. In terms of our activities, most of the work of the HRA is conducted by small focused working groups who are working on a specific topic uh, related to the need for cultural and structural change within universities um, for high bar research. We call these collaborative action groups, and each one of these groups is focusing on a specific theme or a specific topic. And those groups um, identify and coordinate activities that um, either intervention activities or sharing resources, things that can help to um, make those or catalyze the, the cultural and structural changes that are necessary. We currently have five of these collaborative action groups. So the, the five broad topics um, representing, all representing areas that are really important for high bar research and where we think there's really a lot of potential for universities to, to make um, relatively small but very impactful changes um, in order to enable more high bar research. So uh, changes in academic incentive systems. So obviously the promotion and tenure system is extremely powerful in, in um, uh, uh, enabling people to do certain types of research um, and rewarding them for it. So academic incentive systems is a key topic. Facilitating high bar research across disciplines and some of the example projects that Lauren described, so many of these are implementing um, or, or, or involving partnerships with people across disciplines that may not traditionally work together. Um, and encouraging those high bar research projects across those disciplines is really key. There's also cross-organizational cooperation. So there's many organizations outside of the HRA and outside of the university system that all have a similar goal in terms of um, enabling more societally engaged research. And the High Bar Research Alliance as a small organization can partner with those other organizations um, so that um, given that we have such aligned interests um, in so many ways. Uh, building an awareness and understanding of what High Bar Research is and why it's valuable. So that's another key area. And then the fifth one is um, metrics and assessment. So how to evaluate um, and measure high bar research, both the potential for projects at the proposal stage um, as they're, they're progressing and at the end of the project. So, so those are the five key areas that we're focusing on right now with the collaborative action groups. Each one of the collaborative action groups excuse me, has identified um, individual, relatively small short-term tasks or activities. And this is just a schematic that's just showing that organization um, with, within our, our, our the, this, the collaborative action group structure. So each one of the, the five groups has a number of individual task areas, and I'm just focusing on one right now, the facilitating high bar uh, uh, collaborative action group working to connect people across disciplines and encourage projects across disciplines uh, is right now has a very active webinar series 
And one of the activities that that group has is for each one of the webinars, we develop a very short sort of three to five minute typically um, key takeaways video uh, for each one of our webinars. Hopefully, we're hoping as an efficient way to share what those key messages are that experienced high bar researchers um, have identified as important so that we can more broadly share them. So these task groups are the way that we actually um, in, um, cause or, or work on specific things that we think will encourage more high bar research. And we really encourage anyone who's interested in any of these task groups to, um, to become involved. And lastly, I'll just share how you can contact us. So if you are interested in contributing or know anyone who's interested, um, everyone would be encouraged to sign up for our mailing list um, so we can share um, news and events, our webinar series and, and such. We can keep in touch that way. Um, if there's a particular um, collaborative action group or task group that you might be interested in, I'd welcome you to contact me at this high bar at this email address, um, highbar.research.alliance at ubc.ca. Um, and if you know of any colleagues who you think might be interested, please um, introduce them to us. Um, you can share the, our contact information or our website, and then we've got the website address as well. So um, we can include, I think that uh, we already have many of these things in the chat, but we'll make sure to, to share this information as well. Um, so thank you. And I will um, stop sharing my screen and hand over to Will. Good, okay. Well, so um, I would just wish to provide some additional perspective, some broader context on, on what uh, Lauren and, and Michelle have, have said. Um, <clears throat> the sociologist Stephen Brent at UC Riverside in a recent book um, uh, cited this list of the top 50 inventions, projects that involved academic researchers working with industry from 1955 to 2005. This was compiled in 05. Um, but you can see that um, most, most of the um, inventions and innovations are familiar and, and, and uh, foundational. And they were the product of academic researchers working with industry. And although many of these inventions originate in industrial research or the efforts of independent entrepreneurs, he writes, academic researchers were involved in at least three quarters of the innovation cited. In 60% of the cases, funding for research and development came from the federal government. So he writes, spinoffs from defense spending included the internet, carbon fiber, the cell phone, communication, satellites, computer mouse, so on. Um, when we don't have this broad participation that high bar encourages between academia, industry, and government, we have what Clark Miller, my colleague in SFIS, Clark Miller, has um, compiled a list of uh, failures of knowledge systems, famously uh, Pearl, beginning with Pearl Harbor, Three Mile Island, the Challenger explosion. Um, misidentification of Iraqi weapons of mass destruction, and so forth. Um, the, one, one of the most um, eloquent statements about the imperative for knowledge production to deliberately address the common good, I'm quoting Dan Sarowitz, he, he wrote, the linkage between scientific progress and societal well-being is highly attenuated. Knowledge and innovation grow at breathtaking rates, and so does the scale of the problems that face humanity. The science-based revolutions that he cites um, and are knowledge is prolifer proliferating in these areas, but not necessarily equitable distribution of benefits or the uh, societal good. Um, so a, a portion of the research cited, at least a portion, would could probably be characterized as high bar. And we've we've we we know from we've heard from Lauren and Michelle what high bar is. 
but I thought it might be useful just briefly to see that it can be approached from various perspectives. The, the bottom paragraph, um, <clears throat> just transdisciplinarity, which is the overarching topic of, 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 the, of the colloquium, uh, team science, um, national systems of innovation, mode two, and more recently mode three, knowledge production, mode uh mode two being the well we'll get to it the uh, triple helix the famous triple helix of university industry government relations the uh, quadruple and quintuple helices that uh El elias carianus has more recently uh postulated um uh, co-production still others um <clears throat> focusing first on transdisciplinarity we 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 have to look back just a mere five decades to 1972, the uh, first major academic conference on interdisciplinarity. Uh, they <clears throat> codified, codified the taxonomy, the, our, the terms we all know very well, interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, but transdisciplinarity was only vaguely defined as transsectoral. And, that, and that's the meaning we, we, we want to get at in this sense of transdisciplinarity that high bar uh, enlists. So transdisciplinarity is more recently distinguished from interdisciplinarity by its trans-institutional scope, its transsectoral scope, uh, knowledge production construed as co-production between the academy and extramural actors, including business industry and government, when co-produced and coordinated transinstitutionally, I should have had transsectorally, if co-evaluation of knowledge by actors beyond the academy complements the process of peer review. Um, so it is um, the university no longer, as Peter Weingart, sociologist Peter Weingart pointed out, the university no longer functions as the sole locus of Knowledge production, the criteria for evaluation of quality has become social, political, economic, as well as disciplinary. Um, <clears throat> now jump ahead five decades from that first OECD conference in 1970 to 2020, um, they more precisely focus on transdisciplinarity than as a mode of research that integrates both academic researchers from unrelated disciplines and non-academic participants to achieve a common goal um, per, per the specifications of high bar right involving the creation of new knowledge and theory and drawing on the breadth of science and non-scientific knowledge domains such as even including local and traditional knowledge and cultural norms and values. It aims to supplement and transform scientific insight for the good of society. It crisscrosses the traditionally separated realms of science and practice and advances both simultaneously. Um, <clears throat> so this is OCD saying this. The report looks at how transdisciplinary research, which combines knowledge from different disciplines with that of public and private sector stakeholders and citizens, can be used to address complex societal challenges. So they list COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and indeed, key obstacles, as, as, as Lauren pointed out, are, are effectively implementing transdisciplinary research that in a way that research systems are structured and managed and are amenable to policy intervention, uh, including funding agencies or, so that they can adapt to better accommodate the requirements of transdisciplinary research. We could say high bar research in many instances. Um, <clears throat> um, looking back again at the distant distant past, 1934, I mean, not that long ago in the historical record, uh, the Social Science Research Council talked about eliminating barriers between the social sciences and talked about inter, what they termed in interstitial projects. Um, in 2005, the National Academies uh, published a report on facilitating interdisciplinary research, which uh, addressed many of these same issues without explicitly terming it transdisciplinary. 
uh, team science. There's been so much research and publication on, on the concept of team science, or you just more broadly call it team research. So the highlighted passage, um, well, so the definition of team science could, could be applied in to some extent to, there's a congruence with high bar that team science approaches involve two or more individuals working interdependently toward a shared scientific goal. Um, that doesn't specifically mention the transsectoral aspect, but, but so, um, and, and they cite as early examples, the, uh, of course, the, I mean, the Manhattan Project and uh, the development of the system of national laboratories, but the bottom phrase from Ben Schneiderman, the computer scientist at the University of Maryland, um, who invented the hyperlink, I believe, uh, team research is the, uh, and Schneiderman was actually in on the first meetings of the high bar uh, for, for the foundation, the formation of the high bar research institute. Uh, team research is the source of some of the great breakthroughs of all time, such as the 1947 invention of the transistor. It took the complementary skills of an applied researcher, as Lauren pointed out in his slide. Um, it's well known. Uh, <clears throat> we could engage. Um, <clears throat> seemingly disparate con conceptualizations that, that uh, there's a lot of research on distributed intelligence, distributed cognition, cognitive diversity, collective intelligence, collective wisdom, the wisdom of crowds, crowdsourcing. All, 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 all of this has some parallel, some congruence with uh, high bar, with transdisciplinarity and with high bar. So um, <clears throat> I mentioned mode, 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 one, so mode one knowledge production. Well, okay, we begin with mode two, let's say, because this was, and many, many of you are no doubt familiar with this, Gibbons and uh, Michael Gibbons and his colleagues, mostly working in out of the UK, postulated in the 90s, that early 90s, that um, knowledge production had moved from a disciplinary basis, essentially to a trans, transdisciplinary, and applied um, basis, knowledge production carried out, they define mode two as knowledge production carried out in the context of application and marked by its transdisciplinarity, heterogeneity, organizational hierarchy and transience, meaning not a strict hierarchy, top-down hierarchy, social accountability and reflexivity and quality control, which emphasizes context and use dependence. So in a later article, they say it's socially distributed, application-oriented, transdisciplinary, and subject to multiple accountabilities. But paradoxically, mode two, the so-called mode two interdisciplinary research with its theoretical and practical applications is the original format of science from its institutionalization in the 17th century before it became institutionalized in the, in the universities. Uh, Etzkowitz, the, um, the triple helix theorist points this out. Uh, Etzkowitz and Leibesdorf, his uh, co-author in a later publication say it's the original and in organizational and institutional basis of science including networks and invisible colleges, those, those early modern cross-border um, groups of researchers working at the cutting, cutting edge of their respective uh, fields. Um, <clears throat> so mode, mode one is basically something that was almost, well, it's, it's the institutionalization of scientific research in the modern research university in the 19th century in the German research university beginning in Berlin in say 1810, uh, mode one became disciplinary knowledge. It took us until toward the end of the 20th century to, to begin mode two, uh, which we just looked at. Mode three, um, Karianis and his co-author Campbell uh, expand on mode on mode two to talk about a system architecture that engages actively higher order learning, learning, learning to learn, as well as learning to learn how to learn. 
Um, that's actually very important in a multilateral, multimodal, multinodal, and multilayered manner involving entities from government, academia, industry, and civil society. And uh, Karyanis, in, 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 with his quadruple helix, brings in civil civil society organizations and civil society as critical to this to this helix model. And then with the quintuple helix, he brings in the environment very, very importantly. So this is his um, uh, chart, uh, his uh, diagram representing this quintuple helix. Um, he places social entrepreneurship in the center of that Venn diagram, but that sort of Maybe, maybe, maybe there's a argument to be made that this could be uh, looking like this could be high bar research. I don't know. We, we, uh, this is Katina Michael's uh, uh, conceptualization of a socio-technical ecosystem that um, is something to compare as well. Uh, this is in a June 2021 issue of IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society that she edits. Um, <clears throat> Looking back again, I mean, the military industrial academic complex uh, developed as a system of national system of innovation. This is this is all just historical background on on high bar. And of course, uh, the Vannevar Bush report signs the endless frontier 1945 consolidated the formal relationships between the federal government and research universities. This is what makes I mean, this is the 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 social contract. Uh, basic research being performed, but without thought of practical ends. Uh, unlike high bar, I mean, this is this is the this is the the quantum advance of transdisciplinary research, of 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 use inspired research, of high bar research. In 1945, this this model uh, of uh, science, the endless frontier, uh, which was the policy model for the, the next 75 years. Uh, arguably, basic research is performed without thought of practical ends. It results in general knowledge and an understanding of nature and its laws. Basic research leads to new knowledge. It provides scientific capital. It's the it's the wellspring. But but we have to we we only want to fund the purest realms of science. And of course, that's that's the that's the argument the um, the um, argument behind the uh, Republic of Science. Um, that Polyani uh, so famously uh, characterized in his 1960 essay in Minerva, the journal Minerva. Um, so the scientist, Bush said, the scientist doing basic research may not, may not be at all interested in the practical applications of his work. But that's fine, because we don't need that. But of course, we know differently. Uh, scientific progress on a broad front results from the free play of free intellects. So this is this is well known. Um, the argument was that government should support, can strengthen industrial research by supporting basic research and developing scientific talent. So, um, I mean, of course, this is the linear model of innovation. Um, in 1991. Rosenberg, Nathan Rosenberg was already, I mean, was correctly pronouncing it as, as dead. That model represented the innovation process as one in which technological change was generated by prior scientific research. Um, uh, the linear model, <clears throat> so uh, Narayana Murthy, Venkatesh, Venkatesh Narayana Murthy uh, at Harvard was also on the uh, foundational meetings of the High Bar Research Alliance. And in his uh, uh, excellent book, um, he points out that the linear model represents the belief that the technological products of modernity are driven by a process that begins with basic research, which is then taken up in further research activities that aim to solve specific problems. But, but so this is, this is not High Bar. And this is why high bar is a quantum quantum advance. So um, Schneiderman in uh, his 2016 book, The ABCs of Research, 
points out that uh, basic research is, is just conventionally characterized as curiosity driven and then applied research as a separate on the on the continuum is is mission driven looks for practical solutions um so brent pointed out oh keyworth was the science uh, the, the bottom quote uh yeah, george keyworth was the science advisor to um 1983 that would have, was at reagan uh but brent cites him he wrote um this was published in science in 1983 American technological progress suffers badly from the artificial barriers between industry and the bulk of the basic research establishment. Most academic and federal scientists still operate in virtual isolation from the expertise of industry and from the experience and guidance of the marketplace. So uh, he says that this makes the case that this separation is a root cause of sluggishness and innovation and turning research into products. So he he uh, anticipated the, there the argument behind high bar research. Um, the triple helix from we go from the endless frontier then to an endless transition. Um, basic research is linked to utilization, often simulated by government. Uh, uh, Brint, the sociologist again at UC Riverside, uh, describes how beginning in like roughly 1980, in the wake of the Bayh-Dole Act, uh, something that he terms academic innovationism took off. And um, but but he writes, and 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 this is this is the universities doing their best to exploit the potential of technological innovations developed in 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 on campuses, in their laboratories. So, but he writes that um, Etzkowitz wrote that although industry is the key actor as a locus of production and government serves as the source of contractual relations, the, okay, the, the role of the university in this triad is preeminent. The university is a generative principle of knowledge based societies. But by one estimate, 80% of new industries, uh, okay, so in, in consistent with this, um, <clears throat> recent research, by, one estimate 80 percent of new industries are derived from academic research yet um brent points out most large high-tech firms prefer to do their own r d work industry remains by far the largest funder of r d in the us at about two-thirds of the total so uh, this was to get to just um, an allusion to the organizational context of knowledge production that um knowledge um the research university could be looked at as a technology thus amenable to innovation. Um, the, there's been a good deal of research recently on the historical emergence of organizational novelty that is organizational change, just merely planned incremental improvements on already on what already exists, or is it possible to, to birth the genuine novelty? is uh and and then is technological innovation often the product of this historical emergence of organizational novelty so this is just to say that there is an institutional organizational and institutional imperative to um institutionalize high bar research and um that is um we've seen at as taking asu as a case study there has been a good deal of uh, work from scholars in science and technology studies on how responsible innovation, which uh, in Europe is more commonly termed responsible research and innovation, but how responsible innovation was uh, de facto institutionalized at, at ASU, even ahead of its theoretical formulation by science and technology scholars like Richard Richard Owen, for example. Um, so um, back to organizational novelty then uh, doesn't mean virgin birth. Uh, Paget and Powell, sociologists, write all new organizational forms, no matter how radically new, are combinations and permutations of what was there before. Of course, that's been said of technological innovation too, that it's a recombination of what already exists very often. 
So transformations are what make them novel. Well, evolution is not a teleological progress towards some a historical ideal. It's a thick, entangled bush of branchings, recombinations, transformations, and sequential path-dependent trajectories. Just as Darwin said, organizational change in complex institutions must be understood uh, from, from the fifth wave. Uh, we wrote organizational change in complex institutions must be understood as the synthesis of evolutionary processes, which sometimes simply means change that is largely reactive or at best only incremental and planned and deliberate intervention, which could be termed institutional design. So, but when one has to factor in multiple competing and even conflicting institutional logics, the autonomous ivory tower, I mean, that's, that's, that's the, the uh, you know, overarching, you know, uh, Cardinal Newman vision of, 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 the, uh, of, the, of the university. Uh, the, the utilitarian argument that, that came about so prominently in the 19th century with the um, <clears throat> uh, land grant uh, colleges and universities, but also that uh, still calls for the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, uh, bureaucratic, uh, managerial, entrepreneurial, the entrepreneurial uh, is what uh, Brent called academic innovationism. But so then more recently, we're, we're calling that Michael Crow is calling this academic enterprise, social embeddedness, global engagement, public value, responsible innovation, and institutionalization, a lot of research over the past many decades the process by which social processes, obligations, actualities come to take on a rule-like status in social thought and action, cognitive, normative, regulative structures that um, uh, come come to seem taken for granted. Um, I mean, th th this this is this is something that uh, you know is is a, is is a top-down but also bottom-up process in in academic culture. Um, I mean, we can look at institutional design, take it all the way back to Herbert Simon in the early 60s. He talked about the science of the artificial versus the science of design. Design is when you uh, work on developing, uh, you work on addressing how things ought to be in order to attain goals and to function. So then, you know, we've, we've alluded to co-production. Um, this is very much a high con con consistent with high bar that that we have um, multiple subjects, multiple objects, multiple producers, multiple products that that coordinate together with with uh, as Lauren and Michelle point out with a sense of urgency. Uh, Co-production is joint work to fashion a joint world cooperatively and through coercion and resistance. Uh, Co-production describes so a lot of definitions of co-production. Uh, Sheila Jasanoff famously, um, but so integrative research, which is high bar research, I mean, and, and a subset say of high bar research. Uh, Dan Sarowitz and Richard Nelson in two thousand eight wrote the bottom paragraph there. Integrative research advances uh, know-how also, which denotes the knowledge, some articulated, some tacit, tacit knowledge that guides the actions of skilled agents who aim to achieve a particular practical objective. That, that is, the state of know-how defines best practice in an era of human activity. So there's been a lot of work on just the concept of know-how. But know-how is very, that comports very much with the fact that um, in high bar, we have not only academic research, but researchers in industry and, and, and civil society. So it's socially robust knowledge production, which is, which is contextualized. Um, um, the uh, Nowotny and Gibbons writing in 2001 that uh, just as the boundaries between state, market, culture, and science are becoming increasingly fuzzy, so too are those between universities, research councils, government research establishments, industrial R&D, and other knowledge institutions. Um, this brings about an intensification of contextualization. Uh, that's the you know we we talked about that in terms of peer review, but but in in the in the estimation of some scientists that contextualization is unwelcome and imposed. There's research that shows that not all scientists are are happy are crazy about responsible innovation. 
they they they, they look upon it as um, metal metal a meddlesome um, some meddlesome outsiders imposing um, uh, ethical legal social uh, implications that uh, it's not their purview. Um, so then uh, Katina Michael uh, asks, can a more socially robust transdisciplinarity overcome? Oh, this is a Bozeman, very Bozeman question, who writes about the public interest and the public good. Can a more socially robust transdisciplinarity overcome the economic individualization, individualism, what Katina Michael and her colleagues termed the transient goal of profit maximization that defines our society? Uh, there's a glitch in this chart, and this is just this is a chart from the fifth wave book that that uh, upper left first wave belongs up at the top. But but we see that there was a, I mean, Harvard College 1636 American higher education, Oxford Cambridge model four centuries ago. Um, <clears throat> not until the fourth wave, let's say. In 1876, we have the formation of the American Research University. A lot of institutions from the second and third waves became fourth wave research universities. The fifth wave now is, 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 is hypothetical, but in a sense, um, Michael Crow argues that Arizona State University is the foundational prototype. Uh, some other schools, Penn State, University of Maryland system, Purdue University are picking this up. Broad access combined with world-class knowledge production. Um, so this is just to point out a few quotes from the fifth wave to say that uh, it's it's you know deeply embedded in the fifth wave that we need strategic partnerships among universities, business and industry, government agencies and organizations, and civil society. The uh, whereas the new American university is, say, the foundational prototype for uh, a university that combines uh, academic excellence, access, and social impact. Um, the fifth wave is then a league of new American university type institutions. There are networks of heterogeneous colleges and universities whose frameworks are underpinned by discovery and knowledge production and institutional actors from business and industry, government agencies and laboratories and organizations and civil society. So um, as um, so these are socio-technically integrated, scalable, reflexive, complex adaptive knowledge enterprises as we have it. Uh, so they're a plurality of differentiated institutional actors from throughout the national innovation system aligned through academic enterprise, transdisciplinary collaboration and public purpose. This is socially robust knowledge production and innovation. So last slide, uh, next to last slide. So looking back, C.P. Snow, public intellectual in 1959, the two cultures, his famous Cambridge le lecture, uh, trading zones to, to encourage. Um, Peter Gallison talks about, much later, talks about trading zones that represent disciplinary or theoretical subcultures that coordinate an exchange of ideas through the cultivation of mutually comprehensible pigeons or, or creoles. Uh, E.O. Wilson, the uh, uh, entomologist, speaks of consilience. Um, we still have re new conceptualizations, pan-disciplinarity, post-disciplinarity, anti-disciplinarity, and the age of entanglement. So the, the computer, MIT computer scientist Danny Hillis talks about the digitiz digitization of knowledge as a manifestation of residual enlightenment exuberance, computers as cathedrals of the enlightenment, the ultimate expression of logical determinist control. But we no longer can see ourselves as separate from the natural world. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm in, a, in a very oblique way, I think, making a, trying to make a high bar argument here. <laughs> um, we can no longer see ourselves as separate from the natural world or our technology, but as part of them, integrated, codependent, entangled. Whereas in the wake of the Enlightenment, progress was analytic and came from taking things apart. Progress in the age of entanglement is synthetic and comes from putting things together. Instead of classifying organisms, we construct them. Instead of discovering new worlds, we create them. If we are indeed governed neither by the mysteries of nature or the logic of science, but by the magic of their entanglement, then we must seek new ways of understanding this new reality. And he concludes, the, the enlightenment is dead, long live the entanglement. 
Well, Will, I, I have to um, say that I'm just so impressed and, and thankful for the presentation that you've just given us. And, and there was, and, and in, both because of the background and the relevance and the level of detail and the sophistication. Um, but there was one thing that you left out that I, I'd like to add. Um, I'm sure I do. Well, you mentioned a, an important meeting that took place at the um, uh, Association of Public and Land Grant Universities in DC about, I don't know, four years ago, I think. Uh, where um, you mentioned several luminaries who were present um, and, in, and very impactful in leading to the creation of the term high bar research to describe this narrowly defined but very broadly applicable form of research. Um, and also eventually to the creation of the high bar research alliance. Um, what you didn't mention is that you were one of those key luminaries. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I was there, but yes. You, well, you were there and had tremendous impact. And uh, the fact that we had a foundation of wisdom and, and, um, and understanding and knowledge to build upon was absolutely critical. So greatly appreciated. And I should also say that, that both you and colleagues at ASU have been absolutely integral to the creation of the High Bar Research Alliance and everything that we're doing. So I just, just wanted to make sure that that was clear to everybody and, and greatly appreciate it. Um, I don't think there's there's much that I, would, I should add uh, to what you have said. Um, we have a lot of ideas here for discussion. Um, and I, I think, uh, Roba, if it's okay with you, it might be good if we could just move to questions. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, we'd like to, first of all, before we do move quest, uh, to questions, to thank you, Professor Whitehead, Dr. Mossman, and Professor DeVaz. What an excellent overview of high bar research, its dualities, purposes, significance of cross sectoral partnerships, and characteristics of high bar research with you, Lorne. On to Michelle talking about the alliance, individual and institutional membership. And we popped some uh, links in the chat there for our attendees, and we'll also be sharing the slide. So thank you for that. Also about the nature of collaborative groups, um, collaborative action groups focusing on key areas. And then as you mentioned, uh, uh, Lorne, what a masterclass from Will, such an informative presentation about transdisciplinarity, team science, the various helices, knowledge production, and so much more. We do have many questions that I'd like to get to, but I might just pass on to my co-host, Professor Katina Michael, for some immediate thoughts, um, some reflections, and perhaps to get the, um, things going. Thank you so much, Robert, and thank you to our presenters. That was uh, just absolutely spoiling us. Uh, everyone who's registered, who will hear the tape later, and everyone who's here presently uh, will be taking away so much, so much. Uh, you seem to be a hub of connectivity, and uh, beyond the collaborative action groups and tasks and activities that are so intense uh, and bursty, what you're going to probably see is a network of networks emerging from this solid foundation that you've begun. And it's purposive. That's the wonderful thing about what High Bar is doing. It almost flips the research and says that it's not just uh, pure basic research that's important, and it's not just pure applied research that's important, but it's both. It's that Pasteur's quadrant. In fact, it's a DARPA model taken and placed in a societal challenges context, which is incredible. You can work really quickly like DARPA does in bursty projects over two to five years, and you can do both pure basic research and pure applied research together without being uh, in what Stokes calls no man's land, where you don't know what you're doing. But we start with the purposive and we go down that stack that Jans in 1947 so eloquently put together with the normative, the pragmatic and the empirical. We're not for a moment saying we don't need empiricism. We're not saying for a moment we don't need that pure uh, basic research. We need that just as much as we need the applied side, but together it's incredibly powerful. And that word interstitial uh, reminds me of work done in a series called Brave Conversations in Australia by Annie Roland Campbell, who had connections to the University of Southampton and Dame Wendy Hall. They wanted people to talk about this future that uh, Hillis, uh, as you so well noted, William, uh, talks about the age of entanglement. What are these brave conversations? What are these new worlds we're going to discover together? So I think in a nutshell, you remind us all about the need to self-organize as Jeremy Pitt from Imperial College London, our collaborator with Robert Abbas, always talks about at the local level, but developing those ties and those dependencies and those, that trust, that partnering, that collaboration. And uh, I think you're pointing to not only virtual teams, uh, local teams, skill set identification, openness, but a new form of incentivization 
and business model, the current business model, is not going to allow us to continue on a purposive track, on a track that says societal challenges should come before those rich and famous uh, other challenges, which might be just as important, but perhaps not to the everyday person in civil society. So with that, uh, I just want to say again, thank you. What a masterclass and what an incredible mix of theory and practice. Back to you, Robert. Thank you so much, Katina, and I couldn't agree more. We have um, many questions from our audience. I'll start off with one from Kit Kuchika. Ja, um, so this was posed during your presentation, Lorne, uh, but feel free, um, Michelle and Will, if you'd like to jump in as well. So we know of case studies where a research project started with all the good intentions and all the identified stakeholders involved during the development and testing process. But we see later when these projects change to a real life software and services, the investors, a new stakeholder is later involved in the project project cycle, thus at times the project loses the societal connections and tend towards any other money-oriented organisation out there and it loses its core values. Can an effective design cycle avoid this lawn and is there a need for a new design um, or new design consideration? Uh, the, the view is that um, the, the, although high bar research projects absolutely involve partners in society and partners in the university system, the project itself nevertheless has a, a, a life cycle. Um, oh, I see the word cycle is actually in, in the question there, um, uh, where there's going to be a transition from things where applications are still very far away to where they get closer um, and things change. And eventually it's not a research project really anymore in the, in the traditional sense. It really is just part of the world. Um, and uh, I, I think a, a key point is that over that time period, many things change. And it certainly is true, uh, for example, that the, the, the most essential skills may change over time. So we, I, I think that's a really good point. I don't think I can add to it other than to say, anybody who's involved in the leadership, the co-leadership of a high bar research project needs to be aware that the overall skill set of the leadership group should evolve over time. And it should do, do so in response to the fact that the necessary skills for those and knowledge for those leaders will evolve. Um, I don't think I have any uh, panacea for doing that. Uh, we're all people. And sometimes these transitions with people can be difficult. But if everyone's up front and aware of the fact that these sorts of changes are inevitable, um, I think they can be handled. And certainly I've had uh, you know, numerous experiences myself where that's gone really well and somewhere it hasn't. Um, so thank you for an extremely important and helpful question. Thank you, Lorne, for um, that response. I'm just wondering, just to the latter part of that question, Lorne, in cases where it's not gone well, um, as Kuchika mentioned, if a particular project loses its direction or its core values, how does it reorient? How does it reposition itself? In your experience, have there been any success stories where it's perhaps deviated from a particular path and it's been able to um, sort of uh, reorient toward the original objective, I guess? Right. Uh, very good question. Um, yeah, I, I, so it, it, it's often the case um, at that point of transition uh, where the, the sort of most responsible organization shifts from what might be thought of as the university, for example, and might be, for example, a company or an external organization. Um, and those are, are times, especially as things become more related to companies, where it's fairly um, a simple minded idea to say who's in charge. Uh, and if the wrong people are in charge that don't quite get where the things are and what, what needs to happen, sometimes a change in leadership uh, can actually be very helpful. So I, I have seen that work very, very well. Um, and it's not a criticism uh, because people just are what they are. Um, but if there's an evolution where there's a need to uh, get a different sort of worldview in that most important position, that can make a lot of sense. And hopefully it can be planned for so it's not as to be a shock and not to be a dramatic wholesale change of the leadership team, but a gradual evolution of the people who are involved. Thank you so much, Lorne. I might move on to uh, Mariana Zafarakopoulos, who is from the University of Technology, Sydney. Mariana, are you there and able to pose your questions? There you are. Go for it, Mariana. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to um, ask my question. Uh, one of the one of the questions I wanted to pose to the group was uh, picking up on this concept around trust. And I was hoping to learn of whether there are any case studies or examples or perhaps lessons that you've learned from your experience with applying high bar uh, that might help us 
uh, think about or engage with when dealing with uh, complex or fuzzy contexts. In other words, when we don't have all the answers up front, how do we build trust with the communities that we're participating and exploring with? Well, I could just comment that um, I am, you know, I'm a physicist. I'm not an expert on trust. So, but but I would be happy just to share my my own sort of personal view, which is when people are really working together on making important, worthwhile decisions, and they take the time to actually think through and and reach agreement on the goals, and and have and to get all the information, and to listen to everybody who would like to be listened to, and then make a decision together. You know, trust often just arises, in my opinion, arises naturally in those kinds of situations. So if anything, what that says is don't be in too much of a hurry to decide what to do next, but take the time to involve everybody who should be part of the leadership conversation and really work it through. And of course, that doesn't always work, but it's sort of a good starting point. Well, sure. I mean, all stakeholders, the idea that all stakeholders should be brought in as early on as possible. And I mean, there's uh, all sorts of tools of uh, uh, scenario forecasting and uh, immersive visualization tools like the decision theater that, that bring bring parties together. But I mean, uh, even just at, at a most basic level, I, I think just uh, uh, you know, public engage attempts at public engagement and stakeholder engagement. Yes, absolutely. I think you're quite right. There will. Um, I really appreciate the comments, Lorne, about um, uh, organically developing those trusting relationships and also will mentioning those um, methodologies, I guess, for uh, stakeholder inclusivity and bringing the teams together. I do have a related question, if I may, um, in relation to those two points. When we are bringing together these diverse stakeholder sets, we're obviously, um, or in most cases, reconciling competing interests. How do we go about doing so in a manner that is, um, uh, I guess, conducive to building those trusting relationships and not putting people offside in your uh, experience, your collective experience, what's been the best approach or something that's worked across a range of different projects, for example? That, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I, I think, you know, my answer wouldn't be that different than the previous one. Um, that that uh, if, if, you, if the people that have these different needs and different views can know each other really well and be part of the decision-making process and, and really be very open about their differing interests. It can all work out. What there's no room for is secret different interests. That just doesn't work. And, and if, you, if you can't get a starting point where everybody's on the same page and wanting, not necessarily the same things, but are completely open about what they would like to have happen and can find a way that everyone can be happy, I think that's a really good starting point. Um, and I, I think it's a very difficult situation uh, where there, when new players become involved who don't share those interests or even understand them. So that I would say is something to try to avoid if possible. That's an excellent feedback, uh, talking to really the importance of transparency in, yes. in these projects. Uh, I might um, move to Michelle, if I may, for a moment. We do have a question um, that was posed during your talk about uh, high bar research and its commonality or overlap with action research. I believe that was from Mariana Zephyrokopoulos as well. Um, so the question is, it sounds like high bar research has a lot of commonality or overlap with action research. So participating with different stakeholders, designing questions, research actions, activities for those impactful social outcomes. Uh, is this an appropriate way to think about high bar research, Michelle? So as a type of action research, and um, there's also a thank you for a great presentation. Well, thank you. The, I, I'd say yes. So I don't, I don't know a lot about action research, um, specifically exactly what all the characteristics are, but I would say that the high bar research shares um, an overlap with a lot of different types of research where um, you can, so my guess is without, without knowing all of the details, my guess is that there are a lot of action research projects that are indeed high bar research projects as well not so it's certainly not all of them it's not a complete overlap but i would say that if a high if action research shares the characteristics of the dual motivations of new knowledge and um, um, addressing a societal problem and there's cross-sectoral co-leadership of those projects then absolutely um, they are both it's both action research and a high bar research project there is a lot of overlap 
Thank you so much, Michelle. Mariana, would you like to come in there with some reflections, perhaps talking to um, uh, what characterizes action research from your perspective and any reflections on those points? Yeah, thank you again. And thanks for that response, Michelle. Um, as I understand it, action research is uh, distinct from qualitative and quantitative methodologies, but can uh, contribute to, to both. So action research kind of sits between, uses both those methodologies, but the key features are, as you've already indicated, Michelle, around uh, participation, uh, bringing in different stakeholders that are, that are affected by that problem, that have a role or an interest rather in shaping the outcome for it. So as I understand it, action research uh, can mean a whole range of different things and, and the definitions are quite broad, but in essence, those attributes around defining what is the research question or what is it that we're trying to explore and discover. Uh, so no clear answers or, or clarity up front necessarily, but um, how do we work together to explore this space together with a view of Im improving or creating an impact, a social impact uh, at the end. So that, that seems to have a significant commonality with HIBA, if I'm understanding it correctly, around bringing in stakeholders to be able to affect change, uh, a change that's desirable for those, those stakeholders. So, so thanks for um, validating that, that for me. Yeah, and I, so I, I'd agree. I think that sounds like there is an overlap. And if those stakeholders that are being brought in aren't simply being consulted, but are actually actively part of the decision making process in deciding the research question and deciding how you approach it, then then I would say that would classify as an as a high bar project as well. Sounds it sounds like there's a lot of commonalities. It's that certainly those two are, are, are really key um, attributes. Thank you again. Really helpful. Thank you, Marianne, and thank you, Michelle. I might turn to one question, uh, to Will, um, for the final question in the interest of time. We have a question from Kritchika again. Um, do you think it's fair to compare research in academia and in industry? For example, a research lab in a university is limited by its funding, which depends on a lot of variables, even though with research funds, realistically, uh, it is impossible to match the resources which an industry brings in without any bureaucracy loops. And there's an example provided there, Will. But the question is, how can an academic institute compete with such gaps and still be an enabler? Well, no, that 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 isn't that is an excellent question, and and I really should defer this to to M Michelle, who 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 is an expert, and Lauren, who is certainly an expert in this in this regard. But I I, I would just say that um, I, I was I was astonished at the extent to which uh, research, the portion of research is under that is undertaken in industry is 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 much larger than I would would have imagined. But um, what uh, what Michael Crow has done with, for example, ASU, is bring in uh, different revenue streams of funding besides the um, federal government, besides the National Science Foundation and NIH funding and DOE funding. Uh, he he uh, talks about 17 different revenue streams. I mean, this is a, a, a state university a, a public university, but the state only provides 10%, less than 10% of all funding. So, so, so there are significant revenue streams that, that, that can be brought in when you look at, when you make the argument that research is being under, that, that, that you're investing in research, that, that the, you're, you're, this is an investment that, and you should expect a return on your investment. So it's 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 making that value proposition, but 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 so Lauren and Michelle, how how would what would you add to that? I'm not sure I'd add anything, uh, given that it looks like our clock is ticking, and there may be some right. final closing remarks for uh, for oh. others in the call. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Um, so there are many more questions that we can post today, but unfortunately, I think that's all we have time for. Um, such a thought-provoking session. We would like to thank you, Professor Lorne Whitehead, Dr. Michelle Mossman, and Professor William DeBars for joining us today and for such valuable contributions to this fourth series of the Public Interest Technology Colloquium. Thank you for also sharing your slides that we can pass on to our attendees. 
Um, my gratitude as always to Melissa Waite, Cindy Dick and the events team, to our live attendees and also to my co-host Professor Katina Michael. Um, if you would like to revisit this talk or view any of the presentations in series four of the PIT Colloquium or any of the previous series, the recordings will be made available on the Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society's YouTube channel and also on IEEE TV. We look forward to seeing you all in the next series of or the next session of series four of the PIT Colloquium and wish you all a good day and thank you once again to our wonderful speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it.